Drug use and abuse. Uh, okay. <laughs> Summer session. <laughs> I just taught this class. So <clears throat> I'll be as excited as I can be since I just taught it. So let's talk about how you pass the class. Uh, there's only three things that you need to do. Uh, you need to take the uh, chapter test. There's 10 of them, and there are 20 questions per uh, per, per quiz. We'll call them quizzes. Uh, you need to write a 10-page paper. 10-page paper. You need to write a 5-page paper with 5 references about some drug, something, you know, something that you're interested in. Something that has picked your interest. Uh, maybe you think, uh, well, ecstasy doesn't hurt anybody. You can do a research on ecstasy or whatever. Marijuana, heroin, crystal meth. <clears throat> maybe you have a, cr a cousin that uh, that uh, took some uh, bromo bromo fly I think that's what they call it anyway go ahead and, and write your paper on 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 one of the drugs on any of the drugs it doesn't really matter which one uh, and then there are 10 article critiques and I know you guys are going oh they not article critiques but um, I was I've talked to several of my uh, students who've gone on to graduate school and they said you know the, the one thing that, that you forced us to do that uh, really helped us was uh, doing the article critiques because article critiques teach you how to read an article without reading the whole thing I mean if it's a 20 page article you can just look at uh, three or four different things and find out if that uh, what uh, is important in the uh, in the article so it teaches you how to read how to read articles without without reading all 20 pages who reads the statistics anyway <clears throat> uh, okay so that's it what else I have office hours uh, four days a week Monday Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday on Monday and Tuesday my office hours are three to five Mountain Standard Time and on Wednesday and Thursday they are eight to ten in the morning uh, Mountain Standard Time, and this is always my Zoom address, so you can get a hold of me if you uh, would like to uh, talk to me about anything about uh, the office hours. Uh, if you uh, can't meet on Monday, Tuesday, 3 to 5, Wednesday, Thursday, 8 to 10, then you certainly can make an appointment. I will be, I'm available just about all the time. Since I'm online, I don't have to worry about uh, uh, being in class uh, at a certain time or whatever. Uh, so I'm pretty much free all the time, which is kind of nice, I guess. It also means that <laughs> they give me lots of stuff to do. This is a syllabus if you want to take a look at it. That's what it looks like. looks like all the rest of them that I do. Uh, the rubrics are in here. And there is the uh, schedule. We're going to tackle a chapter a week. There's only nine chapters. I think there's only nine chapters in the book. But I've added a, a tenth chapter. It has to do with psychotropic medications. Uh, the medications that uh, if you go it, get into uh, psychology, get your master's degree, um, finish your PhD, uh, and start counseling, uh, then these are the medications that potentially you'll be using. Uh, and it's always good to know uh, how these things work, how the uh, the, uh, the pharmaceuticals work, and this is that's what I'm going to be talking about. The pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're going to be talking about the illicit drugs primarily, uh, and some of these aren't actually illicit. Um, the opioids and opiates uh, they are prescribed from time to time. Uh, we use uppers to uh, treat ADHD, so there you go. We use sedatives to uh, treat uh, uh, to treat uh, individuals that over that uh, have anxiety problems. Uh, we do a lot of strange things. Okay, anyway. So there you go. What have I forgotten? I already talked about that. Okay, that explains how you do your paper. 
there's when all of the, these are due. Uh, as you well may, if you've taken other classes from me, you know that I do not count off for late work. Uh, I would appreciate it if, oh, hey, that, that isn't signed by the, the dean. I've got one that is on, uh, on my desktop. Anyway, okay, you know that I don't count off for late work. So um, if you fall behind or you need to go to a ceremony for nine days or whatever, um, you need to, to run to, uh, to Los Angeles to uh, go to a graduation for your cousin's, your sister cousin or whatever, then, you know, don't worry about it. Just make it up later. Uh, just have everything in by the end of the semester. And the end of the semester is the 4th of August. So, oh, and I'll probably have to have the grades in by the 6th. Is that right? No. The 7th. Uh, so, there you go. <clears throat> there you go. Okay, let's get go ahead and get started. Uh, psychopharmacology. This is uh, actually psychopharmacology is what... Uh, this class, I've taught this class at different institutions and at different places. They call it psychopharmacology rather than drug use and abuse. Um, when I was teaching for Salish Kootenai College up in Montana and Fort Belknap, uh, we called it psychopharmacology. And the reason was because we were a feeder school for the social work, uh, bachelor in social work at Salish Kootenai and for the uh, 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 Bachelor in Psychology at, uh, at University of Montana. And uh, they wanted us to have a psychopharmacology class. Um, this had to do with, some, with, a cert with certification that certain people uh, were seeking. Uh, so they needed a psychopharmacology class. And that's where this textbook came from. It's a really good textbook. It's a good uh, uh, resource. Uh, for you if you decide to go into drug counseling. Uh, so there you go. This is a, and this information that I'm giving you now uh, is the same information I, well, it has changed over time, as you will see. But um, uh, it's the same information I was giving people that are now drug counselors, uh, social workers and drug counselors in Montana. So this is good information, and uh, it's it's we're not going to skip over things. We're going to talk uh, about how the, all this stuff works. Uh, that is important uh, to the knowledge of somebody who wants to be a drug counselor. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's go ahead and get started. There we go. Pharmacology of Addiction, Chapter 1. At present, there is a debate going on over the legalization of marijuana. This is huge around the United States. Uh, strange debate. Uh, lots of people arguing back and forth. Uh, it's now legal in 20 states, including Arizona and New Mexico. And uh, medical marijuana is only illegal in four states. So medical marijuana is legal almost every place in the United States. Uh, you need to be really careful if you're wandering in the middle of the country because Nebraska is one of those states that uh, has not legalized marijuana of any Ill, uh, any kind at all. Uh, Idaho is another one. I can't remember the other two. Uh, currently, the drug that seems to be causing the most serious problems is crystal methamphetamines, opiates, and opioids. Uh, not only are we having trouble with these drugs in North America, but it's causing crisis uh, crises in uh, Europe and Asia as well. And these are people, this is what they looked like before they started taking crystal meth, and this is what they looked like not that long afterwards. There you go. Looking okay, not looking okay, not looking okay, not looking okay. <clears throat> the most serious problem in the United States at present seems to be the use of prescription drugs. So we're not really talking about illicit drugs, we're talking about prescription drugs. This is especially a problem with teens. Last year we had, what, 12,000 overdose deaths uh, due to opiates and opioids. Uh, the biggest killer among all the addictions, of course, is not the 12,000 people that died of uh, overdose. Uh, but it's tobacco. Tobacco is so destructive. 
Uh, states are increasing the limits to, to public smoking. Uh, they're increasing the, the cost of, uh, of cigarettes. Uh, now they're five, $5 or $7 a pack. You know, that's for 20 of them. Um, when I was in the service, well, they gave us cigarettes in our, in our, in our K rations, in our C rations, in our C rations. We get them in our C rations, five cigarettes, a little package of five cigarettes. Um, as weird as that sounds, uh, we could buy a, uh, carton of uh, cigarettes. That's 10, I think. Is that 10 or 20? Anyway, we could buy that for about two bucks. We could buy a pack of cigarettes for a quarter. I mean, that's how bad it was back in, in the seventies when I was in the military. Uh, the use of performance-enhancing drugs in sports has been an issue since the home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 1999. Of course, that was 25 years ago. Uh, and you guys are going, well, those guys are so old. Uh, it is accepted that steroids can cause damage, but new generations of performance enhancers have hit the sports scene that no questionable damage, uh, uh, that do questionable damage, are undetected through drug testing. And of course, uh, what price f glory. These two guys were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Now they only publish Sports Illustrated about once a month. There has been an immense growth of computer games, cell phone usage, and other online problems, especially pornography. Uh, the most popular thing on the internet is pornography. It's not social media. It's not anything. It's uh, it's pornography. There's nothing nothing that comes close to it. Pornography is the most popular thing on the internet. And if you took everything else on the internet and compared it to pornography, pornography would still win, uh, have more uh, adherence. Uh, with the increase of technology, psychologists have been behind the addiction power curve in identifying problems that people are having. And this is, this is a really serious problem that we have in psychology, is the fact that it takes us time to catch up with what's going on. Uh, so the, the problems that we, that we see, uh, potentially no one has identified it yet or no one has done research on it yet so that we are aware that that's what's going on. And of course that happened with television, that happened with the internet, that happened with social media, that happened with gaming. It is happening with pornography. We're not doing anything with pornography. Uh, it uh, potentially is going to happen with uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, so, yeah, this is some interesting stuff. This is one of the problems in psychology. Psychology is always behind, and sometimes it's behind a lot, and sometimes it's just a, behind a little bit. But AI is is the newest problem that we are seeing, and no one is talking about it. Uh, so next semester, um, I'm teaching a class in uh, cinema therapy, social media, uh, and alternative platforms, which includes uh, AI. Al alternative platforms uh, is mostly about gaming, but uh, I'm going to put a chapter in there uh, dealing with AI. I just got my book. <laughs> I just received a book. Um, like two days ago that uh, that covers AI. So I'll see if I can find enough good information in there that we'll, we can talk about uh, artificial intelligence. We've already debated uh, chat GPT. Uh, the faculty is, is talking about that right now. Um, I had several students that use chat GPT. Oh, that's one of the things I probably should tell you. Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, I've already tangled with it a couple times, and uh, the next time I see it, uh, I'm not going to be as kind uh, as I was to the uh, students that used it uh, last semester. So you, uh, if you're thinking, hey, no problem with the paper, by golly, I'll just uh, chat GPT the sucker, um, you probably should think twice mainly because I can detect it. It's fairly easy to detect, mainly because uh, ChatGPT tends to write in passive voice, 
Uh, it also uh, uses uh, references that don't exist. Uh, what's the other problem? Uh, it's grammatically correct. You can't argue with that. So, yeah. If I were you uh, and I were, were writing a paper, you need to make sure that I know that uh, you're you're a good writer, but uh, you're also a, um, a Navajo. Okay, you need to put something in there that <laughs> that ChatGPT. And the other problem, the, the biggest problem with ChatGPT, and and uh, the biggest problem with AI is uh, it talks about things as if. Um, uh, as a robot, I mean, it talks about things that uh, who you know who programmed this thing. That's that's how it talks. Now, if you think that uh, there's some Navajo out there that's uh, uh, that's uh, programming a um, uh, an artificial intelligence um, robot to, to do your papers for you, then then maybe you can get away with it. But uh, otherwise, it's going to make you look like you're not. You're not from Arizona. You're not uh, uh, Diné. You're not uh, you're not an American Indian. I can I can assure you that there are no uh, programmers programming AI that are American Indians. I can't assure you that. I can bet because I've already read a couple of things that I'm doing. You know, I don't think if I don't think people would say I don't think somebody from the Navajo Nation would say something like that. So, yeah, I've already tangled with this once, or actually several times, last semester. So, just don't do it. Bad idea. Uh, too obvious. Early man uh, saw his world as mysterious and dangerous, and they have a, had a basic need to cope with his environment. Early man discovered that by ingesting certain plants, they could ease their fear and anxiety, reduce the pain, treat some illnesses, give them pleasure, and assist them to talk with their gods. And you can't beat that talking with gods. The human brain responds to psychoactive substances. Obviously it does. When people suffer from mental illnesses or behavioral addictions, the altered state of consciousness makes the individual feel better. Psychoactive substances make the individual feel better. Otherwise, they wouldn't use them voluntarily. And, of course, you can guess which one of these individuals is taking some kind of medication. And the answer is all four of them are. <clears throat> Governments, ruling classes, and religious entities have sought to control the supply of drugs through growing, manufacturing, distribution, taxing, and prohibition. Ancient Sumerian medicine men used opium as a secret medicine. There's a shock for you. <clears throat> the pharaohs of ancient Egypt would dole out beer to keep their laborers building pyramids. They just found another uh, another recipe for for beer that they that uh, somebody uh, is making up so that we can drink ancient Egyptian beer. Coca leaves were controlled and doled out by the Incan uh, rulers in Peru to maintain the needed laborers in the country that they controlled. After the Spanish conquered the Inca, they controlled the growing of coca leaves to increase tax revenues. Nothing like big bucks. The American revolutionaries exported and taxed whiskey and tobacco to help finance the revolution. And before the revolution, when the English were controlling all of these things, uh, the American colonies, the, the colonies were smuggling uh, whiskey and tobacco uh, so that they could make more money. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the, uh, the, colon the American colonies broke away from England. England was not allowing them to trade with anybody but other English colonies. Uh, and by doing that, they controlled how much money they could make. Um, if, if you see what I'm talking about. Uh, if they went to a, a French colony, they could sell their, uh, their uh, barrel of whiskey for 100 bucks. Uh, if they traded with a, an English colony, the English government would only allow them to, uh, to charge uh, 75, 75 bucks. 
That's just an example because they weren't using bucks back then. They were using they were using pounds. But uh, that's and that's the way it worked. Uh, and because and because they were controlling the price of of uh, the commodities that were coming out of the uh, out of the Americas, they could uh, lower the price it cost them to buy this stuff, and they could also uh, keep the colonies. Uh, uh, controlled by controlling the amount of money that they had. I know it sounds like a bad deal. Uh, so the American colonies were smuggling uh, whatever they had. They had uh, cotton, they had tobacco, uh, whiskey, of course, uh, rum. Uh, they were smuggling the stuff all over all over the world so that they could make more money. And the English, of course, were trying to control them and control the amount of money that they could make. And that's one of the reasons for the revolution. But the American, and of course, the revolutionaries, once the revolution started, instead of smuggling it in, well, they were still smuggling it, but they were, uh, now they were selling it outright to their enemy or the enemies of England. Uh, that's specifically Spain and France. Uh, technology allowed addictive substances to change, improve, and strengthen potencies uh, over the centuries. Alcohol was first distilled to heighten uh, the potency in Arabia in the 10th century. Morphine was first refined from opium in Germany in 1804. Cocaine was first refined from coca leaves in Germany in 1859. An automatic cigarette rolling machine was invented in the United States in 1881. The stimulant amphetamine was first synthesized in Germany in 1887 to replace ephedra. It was synthesized in Japan in 1919. LSD was first synthesized in Switzerland in 1938. Since Amelia. Uh, growing techniques were first used in the United States to, to increase the THC level of uh, marijuana in the 1960s. Before the 1960s, marijuana was ditchweed, what we would refer to as ditchweed. It had very little THC in it. The THC content of marijuana is 14 times stronger today than it was in the 1970s. And this is after the Sensimedia growing techniques were used. Uh, then they started uh, creating hybrids. And now uh, there is so much THC in marijuana uh, that uh, it's it's highly it's uh, highly addictive. Uh, it's not deadly. It's not uh, you. It can't kill you. This is what the Sensimedia. Um, this is what the Sensimedia growing system is. They use hydroponics and all all kinds of interesting things to grow their marijuana. The amphetamine molecule was first modified to produce designer drugs such as MDMA in the United States in 1910. Faster and more efficient methods of putting drugs into the body has intensified the effects. In 4000 BC, Sumerians mixed opium with alcohol to produce a stronger effect. Good old Sumerians, way to go. It was discovered that the absorptive effects of coca leaves could be intensified if the leaf was mixed with charred oyster shells in Peru in 1450. And this, of course, was before Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. In England in 1800, aficionados discovered that they felt giddy and high from inhaling nitrous oxide. In 1900, Europeans discovered that if they snorted cocaine, they would absorb the drug more quickly. In the United States, users discovered that they could intensify the high of crack cocaine by smoking the rocks in the 1970s. Within the last decade, users have discovered that they could get a bigger rush from select time-release pain relievers such as OxyContin and Hydrocodone by crushing the tablets and injecting them directly into the bloodstream. Over 4,000 plants have been identified as yielding psychoactive substances. 4,000 plants! 60 of these have been in continuous use somewhere in the world throughout history, and they include opium poppies, marijuana tops, coca leaves, 
tea leaves, betel nuts, cot leaves, uh, coffee beans, tobacco leaves, and fruits and other plants that can be used to manufacture alcohol. And we'll talk about how alcohol is manufactured, how you ferment the, the, uh, uh, the fruit, uh, the nectar from the fruit. There is evidence that select groups of Neanderthal in Europe used fly agaric mushrooms to produce hallucinogenic effects for shamanistic rituals. Just recently, we have discovered that fly agaric mushrooms are highly poisonous. Uh, but if you only just use, if you just use a little bit, then it's not going to kill you. But it is going to give you uh, lower intestinal tract uh, distress. Anyway, fly agaric mushrooms. Uh, many of the first cultures considered alcoholic beverages, especially wine, as a gift from the gods. The Egyptians had the goddess uh, Osiris. I think it's a goddess. The Greeks had Dionysus, which is a male. And the Romans had Bacchus, which is also a male god. So we have three gods that uh, their basic function was to uh, have a good time and drink drink wine. The Bible has 150 references to alcohol. Most are warnings against its use. Opium has been cultivated in the civilized world for over 6,000 years. In ancient Egypt, 5,000 years ago, opium was used to treat mental illness and to quiet crying babies. Cannabis sativa has been grown as hemp for thousands of years. The plant has been used mainly for its fiber and manufacturing rope, but also for its medicinal and hallucinogenic properties. And that's what a marijuana plant looks like. You can see it's about uh, 12, 13 feet tall. Uh, mescal beans, peyote, cacti, and psychedelic mushrooms have been used for their hallucinogenic properties for thousands of years. Mostly used by shaman for visions, these drugs have been used in both North and South America. These are mescal beans. The psilocyba mushroom has, uh, was preferred by the Aztecs and the Mayan cultures. Of the 30,000 species of mushrooms in North and South America, only 80 produce hallucinogen, psilocybin, and psilocin. <clears throat> Tobacco cultivation and use dates back 7,000 years in North America. Looking at the substance from a survival point of view, its strong alkaloid properties not only made it noxious to herbivores, but gave it the properties that humans seek. And it is these alkaloid properties that makes it so destructive. Archaeological evidence from South America shows that coca leaves have been prized by the indigenous people there for at least 5,000 years. Evidence seems to indicate that they gave it to the dying to ease their journey to the afterlife. Uh, other drugs used by the ancients included members of the nightshade family, selanikai, uh, which contains the chemicals atropine and scopolamine. During the Dark Ages, people uh, who used these drugs were accused of witchcraft, the medicinal qualities being ascribed to, to demonic possession or collusion. Uh, curiously enough, and I, I have a, <laughs> a botanist friend who explained this to me, uh, but uh, these uh, form woody plants, and if you use that wood, potentially, uh, so what was supposed to have happened was that the witches made their witches, their, their brooms out of this, uh, the uh, woody structure of these plants, and because they were riding naked uh, on their brooms, uh, the uh, scopolamine and atropine was getting into their system through their crotches, and uh, that's what uh, that was part of the demonic possession and collusion with the devil that they were they were having a good time by riding their brooms, and that's why they were cackling so much because this was well anyway. You see what I'm talking about. Uh, Datura, also known as thorn apple, is sometimes made into a salve and absorbed through the skin. And you can find this stuff everywhere. As I saw it uh, when I was uh, at Sely. Uh, we have it here. I just pulled some of this stuff out. Uh, it's a weed. 
I just pulled some of this out <laughs> this, this morning. Uh, henbane has been used uh, as far back as ancient Egypt, 3,500 years ago. It was used as a painkiller and a poison. In ceremonies, it was used to induce insanity, which in turn produced hallucinations and re resulted in prophecies. Henbane. Belladonna, beautiful, which means beautiful woman in Italian, uh, is also known as witch's berry and devil's herb. Uh, this drug dilates pupils, inebriates the user, and can cause hallucinations and delirium. Uh, it's also known as amaryllis, and it has this beautiful f flower. Belladonna. The mandrake is also known as mandragora. Uh, the root of the plant often grows in the shape of a man and was used in ancient uh, Greece to make prophecies. Uh, the drug causes hallucinations and delirium. In 15th uh, century Italy, it was used as an aphrodisiac. One of the stranger psychoactive drugs is ergot, a uh, brownish-purple fungus that causes cereal grain rust, especially on rye, but also on wheat, barley, and triticale. Uh, the ancient uh, ingredient in ergot causes the problem uh, that causes the problem is lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD. Uh, outbreaks of ergot in Europe in rye-growing areas have caused uh, widespread insanity and death. One outbreak in France in 944 was reputed to have killed 40,000 people. And that's what it looks like, ergot. The first written use of caffeine came with the Olmecs 3,500 years ago, who used coca, which is what you use to make chocolate, to produce a stimulating but bitter drink. And if you've ever had uh, unsweetened chocolate, you know that it does not taste that good. Uh, tea was cultivated uh, 1,700 years ago in China and has been used in Eastern Asia ever since. Coffee was first cultivated about 1,200 years ago in Arabia. The invasion of the Americas by the Europeans opened up new markets for psychoactive substances as the European and American people traded their addictive substances back and forth. Coffee, alcohol, and tea were brought to the Americas, and cocoa and tobacco was taken back to Europe. Ritualized use of the stimulants became part of each culture, especially the cocoa. Uh, as curious as that that seems, they they thought it was an aphrodisiac. Uh, so people would give chocolate to their lovers on Valentine's Day, and it still continues to this day. The whole the whole idea that you're you're making your <laughs> your significant other uh, sexually uh, desirous by giving them uh, chocolate. Uh, and actually, it kind of works. Uh, chocolate works better on, it doesn't work on men very well, but it works on women a little bit better than it does on men. So uh, it makes you feel romantic. So, and it works on women better than men. Men don't eat chocolate and then go out for a date. <clears throat> But men give women chocolate, as weird as that may seem. That, it, probably they have no clue that that's what's going on. Uh, but uh, it's the way it works. Opium uh, came back to Europe in the form of a medication known as Theriac, uh, which saw opium mixed with uh, from 70 to, to 100 other medications. Eventually, in the 16th century, a stronger version of opium began to be used as a tincture of opium became quite popular. A substance known as laudanum uh, was used for everything from a sleep inducer to a painkiller to a treatment for alcoholism. In the early 1600s, a new drink was invented in Holland by the monks. It was known as gin. Because of the contamination of the water supply of Europe, only alcoholic beverages could be drunk with impunity. If you drank the water, then you got sick. You, uh, you, uh, they were using their, their rivers as uh, uh, sewers. And, of course, if you're drinking out of the river, then you're drinking someone's sewage. 
Uh, this new drink was flavorful, it was easy to make, and it was fairly inexpensive. It became the drink of choice among the poor in England because it was so cheap. Quickly, alcoholism rates and mortality due to drinking skyrocketed in the back alleys of London. England's growing population stopped growing due to the deaths. Attempts to regulate gin production and distrib distribution led to riots. Production rates septupled. Production rates septupled. That means it multiplied times seven. Finally, in 1751, new laws were passed and gin consumption returned to a less deadly level. Still, control of psychoactive drug use was sporadic throughout the world. Nitrous oxide, also known as, as laughing gas, inhaling parties were not uncommon in Victorian England, though the practice sometimes resulted in more fighting than laughing. Morphine was about ten times as potent as opium. Morphine was used during the Crimean and Civil Wars to treat uh, wounded casualties. Many men became addicted to the painkiller after these wars. Opium became dangerous to life and limb with the development of morphine, but it would get worse. In 1855, the hypodermic needle was invented, making it possible to inject morph morphine. In 1874, morphine synthesized into diacetyl morphine or heroin. Heroin uh, was two and sometimes five times stronger than morphine. Opium became involved in one of the oddest events in the history of psychoactive substances. The British were addicted to the caffeine and tea, but the Chinese demanded silver bullion uh, to, uh, to buy it. Uh, the British had no commodity that the Chinese wanted that the Chinese would buy with silver. The Chinese had eradicated opium smoking from their country in around 1,000. In 1839, the British battled the Chinese to open their ports to the opium trade. The Chinese lost the war in 1842. A second opium war was fought from 1856 to 1860 to open more Chinese markets for trade. The Chinese lost again. Trade went from 15 tons in 1800 to 2.5 million tons by the turn of the 20th century. The British had cheap tea and the Chinese had a, an addiction that they had been fighting against since, uh, since before 1000. Uh, so, so what's the weird thing about this? Oh, so some of the, the wealthy families of England, they're wealthy because of the opium trade. They're also wealthy because of the slave trade. Uh, because they were, it was their ships that were, were hauling uh, the slaves uh, from Africa to all around the world. Uh, but they stopped that in the 1830s, actually, strangely enough. They didn't stop the opium trade. Uh, so a lot of the, the wealthy people of England uh, have their wealth. Uh, they, can thank, they can thank opium for their wealth, uh, which is pretty ugly if you think about it. In 1859, cocaine was synthesized from the coca leaf. It quickly became a new medicine. It was used as a topical anesthetic and used for eye surgery. It was mixed with wine to make a new, stronger concoction. It was used by Freud to control asthma, gastric problems, as an aphrodisiac, and to relieve depression. Now, some people will tell you, especially people that don't like Freud, will tell you that he was addicted to cocaine and he used it for years. Well, I'm not exactly sure that's true. We don't have any proof that that's true. But uh, the assumption is, I hate him, therefore he must have done it. <clears throat> uh, during the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, many patented medicines were manufactured with what would become illegal drugs. Coca-Cola was first manufactured with 5 milligrams of cocaine and, contain, and continues to contain uh, coca extract with the cocaine removed. Coca-Cola continues to be the largest purchaser of Trujillo, Trujillo coca leaf. But all was not paradise in the alcohol-soaked United States. Drunk and high men made poor workers and worse husbands. Inebriation impeded their responsibility, and abuse among drinkers was common. 
The first temperance organization was started in the United States in 1826. Hi, Reese. What, what, what you need? Oh, good, 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 good. Is it, is it the right one? Sight. Okay. Okay, that's great. I, I'm, I'm uh, on, on the line on uh, the internet right now, so I got to go. Th okay. Congratulations. Talk to you later. Bye. Sorry, that was my grandson. He got his soccer ball, so they can use it tomorrow in the tournament. Ah, uh, hot dog. To understand why temperance was so widely accepted in the United States, we have to understand the women's lot in the early 19th century. Contraception was illegal in the United States. Let me repeat that. Contraception was illegal in the United States, so women tended to be pregnant almost constantly because contraception was illegal. <clears throat> as stupid as that sounds. The drinking pattern in the United States followed the path of cheapest booze. Corn liquor was least expensive, so men tended to drink voluminous amounts of whiskey. As if you can, if you've ever tasted whiskey, you're going. What in the world? Women saddled with a sporting husband, somebody who drank a lot, uh, were likely to raise their children in poverty and had to accept his drunken abuse. U.S. consumption of alcohol in 1830 was 7.1 gallons of pure ethanol for each citizen compared to 1.8 gallons today. This is pure ethanol. Pure ethanol is 200 proof. Um, the strongest drink you probably can think of is Everclear, which is 180 proof, but nobody drinks Everclear. It's too strong. Uh, the, the strongest drink you can probably think of is vodka, uh, which is up to about 120 proof. Uh, most tequila is somewhere between 80 and 120 proof. Uh, so that's, that's like about half of it is, is pure alcohol. So at 7.1 gallons per person in the United States, <clears throat> that's like 14 gallons of alcohol a year. That's a lot of booze. A lot of booze. The first state to prohibit the sale of alcohol was Maine in 1851. By 1855, one-third of the states in the United States had laws controlling the sale and use of alcohol. Now, why in the world would they do that? Why in the world would they... Is it just because the women were complaining and the, and the men um, uh, were willing to, uh, to, to stop drinking alcohol? No, that's not what it was. It had to do with labor. It had to do with the fact that, that drinkers are not good workers. And by golly, states wanted needed revenue. They needed to make stuff. Uh, they needed to manufacture things. And of course, that's the reason that they passed these prohibition laws, because drinkers make really poor workers. <clears throat> by 1920, enough states, uh, 33 out of 48, limited the use of alcohol to lead the pass to the passage of the Volstead Act, prohibiting the manufacture or sale of alcohol. But alcohol wasn't the first psychoactive substance regulated. In 1909, the Opium, Opium Exclusion Act was passed banning importation of opium into the United States for use other than medicine. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act was passed, labeling opium as a narcotic to be controlled by the federal government. While the Volstead Act was repealed in 1933, other psychoactive substances have been added to the list of controlled substances in the United States. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the use and cultivation of cannabis. 
1965, drug abuse control amendments regulated the manufacture of stimulants and depressants. In 1970, the, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act consolidated all the drug legislation so that they uh, would be controlled out of, of the same office. In 18, uh, 1984, the legal drinking age was raised to 21. Did the Volstead Act work? The answer really all depends on who was answering it. Good things that transpired from prohibition, cirrhosis of the liver and other alcohol-related diseases declined dramatically, domestic violence fell, uh, violent crime actually fell by two-thirds, public drunkenness disappeared. Okay, so if you're a cop, you're going... And, or a doctor, you're going, this is pretty good stuff. Well, it's, you know, we've got all the diseases caused by alcohol going away. We have domestic violence falling, so the social workers were happy. Violent crime actually went down, uh, by, fell by two-thirds. Public drunkenness disappeared. So what was the problem? What negative things transpired that were directly related to the Volstead Act? It there was an increase of organized crime, and this the organized crime was primarily in the the urban centers like New York, uh, Chicago. Well, obviously Chicago, since we talk about Al Capone all the time. Um, you know, all the all the urban centers. Uh, there was corruption of politicians because the politicians were were bought off by the, uh, by the people that were smuggling uh, alcohol. Corruption of law enforcement personnel, especially in urban areas. Drinking eventually returned to pre-prohibition levels, but it took 20 years, and since the population had markedly increased, the amount of alcohol consumed was actually lower per person. And as we saw, 7.1, where was that? There it is, 7.1. Uh, in 1830, 7.1 gal uh, gallons of pure alcohol. Today, per person in the United States, 1.8 gallons of pure alcohol. So it's gone way, way, way down. So what's wrong with pot? Hemp was grown in the Americas with little problem and until it first began to be smoked as a mild hallucinogen in Texas in 1910, from whence it spread to the rest of the West. In the 1930s, the Hearst newspapers ran a propaganda campaign to label marijuana as a narcotic. Part of the complaint with marijuana was that it was being brought into the United States by Mexicans, so it was a way to control the illegal entry of, of that population. By the 1936, 38 states had branded marijuana as one of the most dangerous drugs. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the growth of marijuana in the United States. Marijuana was used as a drug only in rural areas where it grew wild and in the back rooms of cities where it was identified with jazz musicians and beat poets. And the reason I have this picture here is these are the beat poets of the 50s. This is Allen Ginsberg. I actually heard him speak. That's the only one I know. This is Burroughs. I have a book by him. It's crap. Well, sorry. It's, it's all about drugs. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, the influence of the beat poet's support of using psychoactive substances, included, including marijuana, as an act of rebellion caught on with the youth of that era. With the beginning of the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement became an intermingled with youthful rebellion, which by this time was connected to, the, was connected to marijuana usage. Amphetamines were first synthesized in 1887 in Germany, as we learned earlier. Uh, over the years, the substance was used as an inhaler under the name benzedrine and as an appetite suppressant. During World War II, amphetamines were used to combat fatigue by both sides. As a matter of fact, my father, uh, before World War II, my dad was born in 1918, uh, so he was 20 in 1938. Um, that's before the war started. War didn't start for the United States until 1941. But my dad was driving ammunition trucks from, uh, from northern Indiana to southern Indiana. 
um, and that was he, they were it was this convoy that uh, that drove all day long and all night long uh, and along uh, select roads, uh, select highways, and uh, they gave them uh, amphetamines. They were supposed to make two two circuits a day, and uh, they gave them amphetamines to take. If uh, if they started getting woozy, but my dad, uh, my dad drank coffee instead. He was a big coffee drinker, uh, and that's when he p picked up his his coffee drinking habit was uh, when he was driving ammunition trucks. Uh, not, during the he he joined the army during uh, World War II, so uh, he stopped driving all those ammunition trucks, and they offered them uh, amphetamines. Uh, when he was in combat in in Europe, but they all they especially used uh, amphetamines in the south in the South Pacific against the Japanese. In the 1950s and 1960s, amphetamines were used uh, in diet pills. By 1970, it was estimated that six to eight percent of Americans were using diet pills. Uh, amphetamines were part of the fuel of the hippie movements and the Summer of Love in 1967. Uh, Congress passed the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, potentially to, to control all these guys that were anti-war. And drawing flowers on women's breasts. Sports were pretty much the purview of the wealthy and the extremely gifted uh, through the first half of the 20th century. It wasn't important enough to try to cheat or gain an advantage. Uh, this is Johnny Weissmiller, uh, who was an Olympic champion, uh, later became Tarzan in the 1930s, uh, 1930 movies. Uh, with the Cold War after World War II, every field uh, where the free world met the communist world became a battlefield of sorts. The world of sports, and especially the Olympics, became a very contentious area of conflict. Eastern Bloc countries, led by the example of East Germany, began giving their athletes anabolic steroids, creating super-athletes. The world was appalled by the results and came out against the practice in 1968. Since then, all amateur athletic organizations have banned uh, the use of steroids, along with the professional athletic organizations around the world. And this is a picture of this young lady, uh, who is a shot putter, who is now a man because of all of the steroids that they fed her uh, throughout her competition years. And now she is a he. She's transgender. Um, whether she felt like she wanted to be a boy, a, a male, uh, is questionable. You might say, well, she was, she was probably, would have been transgender anyway. Uh, but the answer is she didn't really have much of a choice. They gave her so much, uh, anabolic steroids that, uh, by the time she was an adult, she was, or by the time she was older, she was, uh, and out of competition. She'd taken so many steroids, she felt like a male anyway. Sedatives have been used since the beginning of the 20th century in the form of bromides, chloral hydrate, and peraldehyde. Barbitol was marketed in, as uh, Veronal in 1903. Phenobarbital was developed in 1913. Sedatives became very popular during the Depression and World War II eras, peaking in this time period with over 50 different barbiturates dominating the market. In the 1950s, doctors realized they had not only overprescribed the drugs, but they had created a whole generation of addicted adults. In the 1950s and 1960s, a whole group of milder tranquilizers were developed to replace the more dangerous tranquilizers. Milltown and benzodiazepines such as Librium, Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, and Halcyon became the most widely used drugs in the world. Ergot, barley rust, uh, had created havoc wherever it appeared, and no one knew why until Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman isolated the active ingredient lysergic acid diethylamide from the fungus. After his discovery, Hoffman accidentally dosed himself and discovered the psychedelic effects of the substance. 
The United States Army and the uh, CIA brought the, uh, bought the rights to LSD from Hoffman and experimented with the drug through the uh, 50s and into the 60s. Uh, it was called MT, uh, M MH Ultra was what it was called. I think that's what it was called. Anyway, yeah. So they, they were experimenting on it in the 50s and 60s. They were trying to do things like uh, aerosol, uh, LSD, so that they could spray it on troops and make them, you know, zone out, trip out, dude. But uh, it, they couldn't get it to work. One of the researchers working with the CIA was Dr. Timothy Leary of Harvard, who decided that the psychedelic substance needed to be shared with the world. So he did. Otherwise, we wouldn't have LSD. We wouldn't have had all the problems we've had with LSD if it hadn't have been for Timothy Leary. Drugs today, 1.5 billion people drink alcohol around the world. 76 million of these people have an alcohol abuse disorder. And one, two, I'm not sure what he's doing. He sure, certainly has a red nose. And two bottles of wine. Uh, 180 million people worldwide abuse illicit drugs. 160 million people worldwide smoke marijuana each year. Probably more. Uh, it has been estimated that 20 to 60 percent of all hospital beds are inhabited uh, due to drug abuse. And that is so irritating for medical personnel. Because normally when somebody comes in, uh, you ask them how much they've had or whether they have a, a drinking problem, and nobody has a drinking problem, and everybody had just a couple beers. It's, people obviously lose their ability to count. Illicit drugs figure into the economic structures both where they were grown and where they are used. Heroin, cocaine, marijuana, MDMA, ecstasy, and methamphetamines. Uh, geopolitics. This is big stuff. Illegal heroin is grown in four areas of the world. Uh, the Golden Crescent is an area in Southwest Asia that encompasses areas of Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. The Golden Triangle encompasses parts of Southeast Asia, uh, countries of the Asian countries of Thailand, Myanmar, which is used to be Burma, uh, and Laos. This, that, this is the Golden Triangle. This is where the drugs uh, coming into Vietnam were, were uh, coming from. Mexico exports uh, a form of heroin that is dark in color and called black tar or brown heroin. Colombia not only exports cocaine to the United States, but a white heroin as well. White heroin found in the Golden Triangle, Golden Crescent, and Colombia is a purer, stronger heroin than the black tar. 90% of the world's supply of illicit heroin come from the poppy fields of Afghanistan. 60% of Afghanistan's wealth comes from opium sales, and U.S. efforts to curb production uh, ha has resulted in an increase by 50%. And we did try to curb it during the Afghan war, uh, and it just continued to increase. The nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang party dealt with the drug tongs of Shanghai while they controlled China. After the Kuomintang were expelled from China, they continued to grow and market opium along the Thai-Burma border in order to buy weapons for their defense, their defense against the, the communists to keep fighting the war. The Vietnam War was a quagmire. Not only was the war being fought in the Golden Triangle, but the United States allied itself with some of the most notorious drug smugglers in the area, the Hmong. The Hmong were excellent allies against the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong as they moved freely through Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam and fought the communist soldiers who encroached in their area. And now we have several ten, tens of thousands of the Hmong. We transported them, uh, the CIA, they were actually being, uh, they, the CIA hired them uh, as soldiers and uh, they brought them to the United States. So there are, in certain areas of the United States, there are large populations of Hmong. Um, 
Minneapolis has has uh, a large uh, group. Uh, Milwaukee and uh, Detroit have large. As a matter of fact, they made a movie of the Mong. Um, it's called Grand Torino. It had uh, Clint Eastwood in it, and he interacts with uh, with a group of of Mong. Cocaine doesn't grow just anywhere. Cocaine grows mainly in the humid mountain valleys of Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. Cocaine has been uh, at the forefront of the political problems in Colombia for over half a century. Drug cartels operate with impunity throughout the country and control many of the decisions being made locally and nationally. Worldwide, 25 million people, that's the size of Texas plus Montana, uh, have died from AIDS and another 40 million, that's the size of California uh, if, uh, and Oregon put together, are infected with HIV. In the United States, around 900,000, that's the population of Montana, uh, are, uh, people are infected with HIV, while 500,000 population of Seattle have died of AIDS. When the AIDS epidemic first hit in 1982-1983, it was mostly caused by unsafe sex between homosexual males. But in time, it spread into the intravenous drug-injecting uh, population and now is more likely to be contracted by sharing contaminated needles than any other cause. Uh, I was working in medicine in 1982-1983, and I can remember when this hit. Uh, we, I was working in uh, Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, and we were, <clears throat> nobody knew what, we, we had no idea what it was. We didn't know whether it was a virus. Uh, at the time, it hadn't been identified. It was just killing people, and it was killing uh, gay men, especially in New York and San Francisco. Uh, it was really kind of weird. Um, and, and we kept having meetings talking about, well, what, we're going to, what are we going to do if it comes here? What are we going to do if it comes here? Uh, we had no way of treating it. We didn't know what it was. Uh, that is when, uh, before uh, AIDS hit, uh, we didn't wear gloves very hardly ever. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were hardly any gloves to be had. You, you had to ask for them to get them. Uh, but now everybody wears gloves like all the time. And that's, uh, that's mainly because of HIV. I used to draw blood. Uh, I drew blood with uh, bare hands. Uh, nobody thought anything about it. Uh, you know, there, there, was, there was no reason to be as, uh, afraid of blood or uh, anything. And uh, it, it got tough. It got tough after, the, uh, after AIDS hit. We had uh, people that... Uh, were really good at drawing blood who uh, couldn't draw blood anymore because they had to wear gloves. And, of course, back then the gloves were a lot thicker than they are today. So the people who manufactured gloves made lots and lots of money. Hepatitis C is a liver infection that infects 4 million uh, people. That's the population of Los Angeles proper. Uh, the Los Angeles area is a bunch of cities that have grown together. Uh, there's like 15 million people in that area. Um, 85 to 90 percent of all intravenous drug users are infected with, H, uh, with uh, hepatitis C uh, virus, mostly from sharing their needles. Ever since the Roaring Twenties, people have been mixing the coolest of music with psychoactive drugs. In the 2000s, it was jazz mixed with cocaine and bootleg liquor. The women were called flappers, and the men were referred to as jazzbos. And this is a flapper, and that's a jazzbo. So those are the cool, cool kids of, uh, of the 1920s. In the 1950s, the music was the blues. Uh, the psychoactive drugs were heroin and whiskey. Uh, the men and the women were either called beats or beatniks. As cool as that is, it gets better. In the 1960s and 1970s, the music became hard rock. The psychoactive drugs that fueled the music were uh, LSD, speed, marijuana, and wine. They used to have the <laughs> they used to have what did they call that stuff? Uh, Boone's Farm. That's what it was. Boone's Farm was really popular. 
Uh, the people were hippies and the women were chicks. Women always get special names. That's not fair. Well, not in the beatnik era, but they were flappers in the 1920s and they were chicks in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, that was in the United States. In, in uh, England, they were called birds. Well, and the reason they were called birds was because they were called chicks. Uh, we won't go into how strange people are. Uh, as we drifted into the new millennium, the music became techno or electronic trance music. Uh, the psychoactive drugs that fueled the craze were MDMA, marijuana, nitrous oxide, ketamine, GHB, and beer. Uh, the participants are referred to as ravers. Women don't get a special name. That's not fair. Marijuana continue, continues to create controversy. Legalized in many states for medicinal purposes, people are required to have a prescription for its use. Marijuana continues to be the most widely used illegal drug throughout much of the world, including the United States, Canada, Australia, Mexico, and South of Africa. And uh, what's happening? Oh, 20 states have legalized it, including Colorado, uh, Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, the destructive effects of tobacco have prompted many countries to try to curb its use. Cuba banned smoking in public places. Ireland has banned smoking in pubs. In many states in the United States, smoking is banned in any public area, and this includes Iowa, Illinois, Arizona, and Montana. As late as 1966, almost half the population smoked regularly. That was about 42.6%. By 2005, the percentage of regular smokers in the United States had declined to less than one quarter of the adult population, about 22.5%. This decline had much to do with the discovery that cigarettes contained many carcinogens that cause disturbing medical problems. Uh, 1,178 people die every day from the effects of tobacco. Um, a study in England uh, showed that smoking can reduce your life expectancy by 10%. And there's the President of the United States touting uh, Chesterfield cigarettes. Uh, he sends them as Christmas presents. Uh, it's like sending somebody <laughs> a bomb. <laughs> Way to go, Ronnie. Despite the reduction of revenue for tobacco companies in the United States, they have been able to keep profits up by developing foreign markets in the third world. In the United States, tobacco manufacturers have tried to sustain their market by targeting females, minorities, and younger smokers. In 1998, tobacco companies agreed to pay $246 billion over 25 years for their illicit practices. And that expires this year. So hopefully they've spent their $246 billion. Worldwide, 33 million people use amphetamines or similar stimulant substances. In the United States, 16 million meth labs were raided in 2004. However, meth labs have been partially controlled by controlling the precursor uh, chemicals ephedrine and pseudoephedrine found in common cold remedies. And here is where uh, in 2014, there were 9,338 meth labs that were busted. And the state that, that uh, is the leader is my home state of Indiana. Way to go, Indiana. Uh, looks like Missouri's second. Yeah, Missouri's second. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that uh, some of the precursor chemical, one of the precursor chemicals is um, uh, liquid fertilizer. Uh, ammonium nitrate, I think, is what it is. Anyway, there's a lot of farms in Missouri and Indiana. Ugly stuff. Treatment for the amphetamine usage was skyrocketed in the past decade. In 1993, only 21,000 people sought treatment for amphetamine addiction. This figure had increased to 151,000 by 2004. Other stimulants also make an impact on our lives. The use of caffeine is re in recent years has increased markedly. 
Coffee kiosks have sprung up in tiny towns, and sales of caffeinated soft and energy drinks have exploded. 80% of teens, that's 4,300,000, abused Vicodin in the form of hydrocodone in 2004. Hydrocodone is the most widely used and abused prescription opiate. 10%, 2,300,000 teens, abused the opiate Percodan in the form of OxyContin, the time-released version of oxycodone. And boy, you do get sexy when you're taking drugs. Alcohol directly kills 75,000 people in the United States every year. Alcohol directly kills 1.8 million people worldwide every year. 17.6 million Americans have an alcohol abuse disorder. That is 8.5% of the adult population. Uh, alcoholics uh, make up 10 to 15% of people in hospitals, 10 to 20% of people in nursing homes. As sad as that is. When MRIs were done on gamblers, the portions of the brain that were activated by winning and losing were the same areas that were activated by cocaine. Statistics show that 2.5 million Americans are classified as pathological gamblers. 3 million Americans are classified as problem gamblers. 15 million Americans are at risk for problem gambling. One study in Minnesota in 2004 found that 1% of the gamblers accounted for 50% of the wagers. In the same year, among the riverboats of Illinois, 10% of gamblers accounted for 80% of the revenues. While gambling may be the most economically devastating behavioral addiction, there are others that are equally personally devastating, compulsive overeating, anorexia, bulimia, internet addiction, sexual addiction, excessive TV addiction, compulsive shopping, and pornography addiction. And we're going to talk about all of these. Uh, we're going to deal with all of these uh, as we go through the, uh, the next nine chapters. And that is the end. Sorry about uh, the telephone call. Uh, it's only, it only lasted a couple of minutes, so we're okay. Uh, so I'll talk to you guys next week. We'll tackle... Chapter 2.